Welcome to California Edition. My name is Brad Pomerantz. We are coming to you from our Sacramento Bureau, and we are joined by Senator George Renner. He is a member of the Board of Equalization. And so I want to speak with you not only as a member of the board, but as a former legislator, both mm -hmm. in the Senate and the Assembly. You've seen good times. You've seen bad times fiscally. Right. I guess one could argue we're in good times right now. Or are we? Well, I, you know, they're, they're a little bit manufactured right now. Okay. There's two issues going on right now that have created this surplus that you right. hear talked about right now. Um, the first one is Californians voted themselves a tax increase last they year. They did. And so as a result of that, uh, you know, additional revenues have come into the state of California. Now, the thing to remember about those is those are all temporary. They right. go away. And so... What's you, interesting, though, if I may say, uh -huh. is... They go away. You're right, absolutely right. right. They get sunset. Both, both income tax right. and sales tax. But yet, the CLA predicts that there will be a budget surplus of almost $10 billion in 2018, which is after at least one of the uh, taxes right. sunset, which is so surprising well, to me. And, and again, part, part, part of the issue, too, is that part of the other side of that, the equation of right. where money is coming from, is increase in capital gains revenue right. in the state of California. Of course, that Blessing goes, and a curse. Well, that goes back <laughs> to California's fiscal structure, which is we, we have very high, a lot of income tax revenue that comes in the state, and we, and we doubly hit those who earn a lot of money. And as a result of that, during good times or when, when the stock market's up or real estate is up, people sell. And as a result of that, then there's extra revenue coming in. But it, as we've learned in the last few years, it's 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 not very predictable. And so, I I, I mean, I've been here long enough that yes. I don't worry about what projections are in 2018. Fair enough. Um, you know, and but but the reality is, right now we do have some extra money. And so the question is, how do we spend that money? What do we invest it in? And that that becomes a real issue. For and us. let's talk about that. The governor has proposed a couple of items. He's looking to pay down what he calls the wall of debt. Right. He's looking to create a rainy day fund. We haven't heard about a cut in taxes. I mean, one could argue. Well, you know, and I, again, I, I'm not sure with the issue of cut in taxes is the key issue right now because right now I think we need to just be preparing ourselves for when it is that those taxes fall off in the next couple okay. of years. Because what you are hearing, unfortunately, is you're hearing some folks in the sac in, 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 in the capital and some ele statewide elected folks saying, well, maybe we need to keep those taxes on. Mm. And so, to me, that's my greater concern. My greater concern, quite frankly, isn't whether or not we're going to get a tax cut as much as it is, are we going to learn to live within our means so that people actually are going to see these taxes fall off when, they were, when they're supposed to. Well, let's talk, though, about the rainy day fund, mm -hmm. because that is a mechanism that I thought we had adopted in 2004 when the voters passed, I think it was Prop 58. Right. We had a rainy day fund for a short time. It got raided very quickly. We have not replenished that rainy day fund. So why is it we're talking about creating another rainy day fund? Well, What's wrong with this the, rainy the day fund? The problem is that uh, the legislature in its history has uh, used these rainy day funds, I think, as more gimmicks than reality. Mm -hmm. They really are not committed to putting away money. And the problem is there's a lot of pressure. When there's extra money all of a sudden sitting on the table, the idea of setting some right. of that aside for something else in the future versus, oh, we got all these needs now, uh, the problem is you've got you know 120 legislators right. over there who want to spend, right. off, many of them want to spend it now. But the governor has been firm. I mean, I've heard him be called the best Republican governor we could ever wish for by a member of the Republican caucus. So be that as it may, you know, what do you think about the proposal you know, for I, the rainy day fund by the governor? You know, and spending with governors is an interesting issue. I, I right. remember um, I, was, I was vice chair of budget in yes. the assembly representing Republicans then yes. in the budget negotiations with Gray Davis. Ah, yes. And I can remember going into Gray Davis's office and we were talking about budget and he looked at me and he said, George, I'm going to be your best friend for Republicans <laughs> exactly. when it comes to Let's spending. Let's continue the conversation when we come back. We're okay. speaking with George Runner, member of the Board of Equalization. For our viewers on HLN, thanks for joining us. For our other viewers, we'll be right back. And that story is somewhat humorous, but I understand it. I mean, you do see that Gray Davis has been looking. Well, he had been looking. I don't want to talk about Gray Davis. Let's talk about no, the current the, governor. Here's the, yeah. the, what the yeah. transition here is going to be, and that is the problem is governors have to deal with our legislatures. Yes. And that's going to be the issue, and that is whether or not Jerry Brown will be able to re actually curb the spending appetite. Well, so, Senator, let's continue the conversation right. about spending and the pressures that governors feel. Yeah. What is your sense of Governor Brown and his attempts to kind of quash 
what some believe is a desire by the legislature to spend the surplus. Well, yeah, right, and and again, and, and you know, you use spending two different ways too. And then there's there's spending that you can spend because you all of a sudden have a lot of money coming right. in, and you can spend it one time, just like at home. Of course, you know, some, you, know you get some extra money in, in 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 a given month, in a given year, and you go out and buy one thing. Right. Or one time, right one time spending, of or you go ahead and get some money coming in one time, and you say, "I think I want to buy this new car, and I think I want to pay for it over five years." And let me ask you about that because there is a proposal by the Democrats in the legislature to create what's known as TK, transitional kindergarten. Right. I think a lot of folks believe it's a worthy plan philosophically, you know, get kids in school earlier. But Governor Brown did not include it in his January proposal. And the concern of some, and I would guess all you as well, is that it's a new program yeah. that could cost a billion dollars. It's a very expensive program, and and you hear, and you got to remember what we're doing there too. I mean, it's about it's. I don't have any problem with the idea of trying to focus on children who you four year olds who and you're are an having, educator. Yeah, <laughs> who, who who have who have who need some extra help and ah. focus on those kids. That makes sense. But to all of a sudden undo the whole program where you have right now many families who are paying out of their own pockets for those programs, shift that then to a state paid for program, right. government or taxpayer paid for program, um, that has ongoing expenses to it every year, just doesn't make a lot of sense. And again, it's not like California schools are stellar. <laughs> One um, could argue. Yeah, you know, right. I mean, it's kind of like, is that really, are, right. are we doing so well everywhere else in our education system that we should add another year? But it's an example of that one-time versus ongoing. and. It's, it's a big ticket item, and that's the problem that the governor will face. So let's talk more about the rainy day fund, though, because what the governor has proposed right out of the box is funding this fund, the rainy day fund, with $1.6 billion as a down payment. Mm -hmm. Is that enough in your mind? Well, again, I, I think that's a good start for that. I, 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 at this point, I'm... I think anything we can put in a rainy day fund is the right thing to do. Okay. I'm more concerned with the base spending that we're going to be doing and whether or not then, because it's one thing to have a rainy day fund, but it's another thing to have a rainy day fund that you may be having to tap next year. Right, of course. Or the year after that. It should be for these big economic problem times, not something that we can just maybe borrow next year when up because we over budgeted this year. What about the wall of debt though? The governor has talked about that countless times. At a minimum, we have about $25 billion in loans and deferred payments. Right. That doesn't even take into account well, under un, unfunded pension and that, And that's why it is when people talk about the surplus, they're really not really understanding right. the whole commitments that were made during the time when the spending was going on. We actually borrowed, took, stole money all over the place. <laughs> Uh, and we're not paying that back. And so the idea of trying to get some of that off the table is important, but we need to be getting more of it. That's why, quite frankly, we shouldn't be expanding programs right now. We should be trying to figure out how to get our feet back on the ground so and get I dealing in that. So I really get into the weeds, though, and get a sense from you as someone who's been looking at the budgets for got over a decade. Should we be paying down more of the tangible loans and deferred payments, or should we really be looking at these unfunded liabilities, these underfunded pensions? Well, the first thing you got to do is you got to pay back the money that you owe now. Okay. I mean, it's kind of, I mean, I, the, we, you got to do both. Fair enough. You got to do both, but quite frankly, if you can't take care of the debt that you know that is right, the short term, the stuff that you move money around, and you can't take care of that, then it's pretty clear you're not prepared to deal with the big problems. No, I hear you. And so I think it's important for us to kind of dip, to get that first, a, recognize what our big problems are, but then that's why it is we need to get the spending under control. Mm -hmm. We need to figure out how to do the kinds of things we can do with, do with the, the amount of money that we have rather than more. Okay, so we pay down the immediate loans, but now we have the question of the underfunded pensions to the tune of over $200 billion. Right. Sir, that is very frightening for anyone to hear. You know, and right, and the, and the problem is if you just look at the issue of the budget and revenue coming in as kind of the only part of the pie, then you, you, you'll get really frustrated. The other thing we've got to look at is how do we grow the budget without putting in new right. taxes? Right. How do we get businesses and to come and grow? How do we get, <laughs> how do we get people? Right. I talk to retired folks who are, have good pensions who are leaving the state of California. Right. And, the, and there's a lot of folks out there that are looking when they are when they're when they're when they're able to go when their feet are free, and they you know they, whether it's a pension program right. or a job that they can move, they're gone. Okay. And that's the concern I think we Please need to look at. Please come back and let's talk about this issue. His name okay. is Senator George Runner. He is a member of the Board of Equalization. My name is Brad Palmer. This is California Edition. In what year did California voters defeat Proposition 82? 
which would have made pre-kindergarten available to all four-year-olds in the state. California voters decisively defeated Proposition 82, backed by actor-director Rob Reiner in 2006. Welcome back. It's Charter California Edition. I'm Brad Pomerantz. We are joined by Mike Ramos. He is the District Attorney for San Bernardino County running for re-election. That election will be held in June 2014. And so I want to speak with you about the death penalty. Yes. It has become a very contentious issue throughout the nation. There have been some states that have banned the death penalty. Right. And these are not lefty liberal governors banning right. it. These are Republican governors that are banning it. Yes. A lot of concern, fear. In California, there was an initiative last year. Right to eliminate it. it. Correct. Didn't pass, but close. Right. right. But you're looking to reform yes, the death penalty. We're looking to fix it. And you Prop 34, you're talking about the voters said, we still want the death penalty. But in order to get that vote, we went out and made a statement, the elected DAs, right. we will fix it if, if you just keep this in place. Because you're right, across the nation, they're attacking the death penalty. Right. The ACLU is other individuals. The frustration, but it, but if work. I may, the frustration Please. is not so much about the act, right. but of how long it takes to commit the actual penalty. And that, and it is more likely, you know this, it's well, more it, likely that a death row convict will die on death row of right. natural causes than him being put to death. In the state of California, you're right, and that's why we need to fix it. And one of the major components of this initiative, it's gonna take that app appellate process, fix it, and streamline it. No longer do you have to wait for three decades like a Kevin Cooper mm -hmm. who murdered a family in Chino. You will get an attorney appointed immediately within the first year. You will file your direct appeal, not to the California Supreme Court, mm -hmm. they're, pa they're impacted, yeah, okay. to the appellate court or the local super uh, superior court, and you have to file your motions within two years, and there will be a hearing within five unless there's exceptional circumstances, and that's gonna be rare. So that's a big part of it. And there's a, a couple other pieces too that I think the public should know Let about. Let us know, please. Well, the other one is, is this is going to save taxpayers money. They're going to say how. No longer will we need to house all death row inmates in single cells at San Quentin. We'll be able to house them in all the state prisons. Because? Put them up together with the initiative. Put them together with other prisoners. Make them work. They don't have to work. Make them so work and give Marcy's law. law okay, right, please. Marcy's law, 70% of the money they make will go to help victims. I mean, that's the bottom but line. Uh, current under law. current law, they have to be segregated? Yes, they get to be segregated, single cells, Why? television, magazines, Why? newspapers, because that's what the law says. That's how it's developed over, the, over, over time in the state of California. What about the question of innocence and guilt? Right. That still causes some trepidation amongst even the most strident of death penalty right. proponents. The beautiful thing about the Proposition 34, we said look at them all. There's a little over 700 uh, inmates on death row. You tell us and show us one that's innocent, and we'll look at that. Not one, not one, because we use our discretion. When we seek death penalty, we really make sure there's proof beyond a reasonable doubt, beyond that. And now the advent of DNA, et cetera, et cetera, Another example, Kevin Cooper, every time he goes to appeal his case, we test more DNA, there's more evidence that he's the, the murderer, he's the killer. So there's nobody innocent on death row in the state of California. And I challenge anybody to say there is and prove it. But we know that people have been exonerated. I don't know if any murder defendants have been exonerated. Not uh, but I know that nationwide there have been individuals exonerated that were in prison for a very long time, often rape convictions. And that's a beautiful thing about DNA. Mm -hmm. If we can show that somebody did not commit the crime, because that's what justice is about, mm -hmm. and protect the innocent, not just prosecute the guilty, but I, uh, again, not, not somebody for murder in the state of California, mm -hmm. especially somebody sitting on, on death row. So what do you think will happen? Will this initiative be on the ballot come November 2014? Well, we need help. We need help from your viewers. We're gathering signatures now. Uh, we've you got, got a, three former governors on board, Democrat I, I, and Republican. I, I, I don't did. know how you did that, but you did. Well, you know, we, we had a press conference with Governor Duke Magian, Governor Wilson, Governor Davis, and we stood there and we, we said we need to fix this. We need signatures. We're, we're looking to get 1.2 million signatures. We need over 800,000 right. valid signatures. Right, right. That's a lot of work, but we need help. So what's the process now? It's simply signature gathering? It's signature gathering. We've got to get it uh, qualified for the ballot, and uh, there's going to be signature gathering events across mm -hmm. uh, the state of California. The John and Ken radio show is going to right, have from one. KFI, from KFI, AM, KFI in AM, Los Angeles. Uh, and they're going to have one here in our county in mm -hmm. Ontario at, at the Ayers, uh, mm -hmm. the Ho Ayers Hotel, uh, and I believe that's going to be in March. 
I want to shift gears and talk about the victims. Sure. Because you have been a proponent for victims' rights for quite some time. Yes. And I know coming up, there is the annual Victims' Right Candlelight yeah. Vigil. Sure. Talk to us more about the victims, the yeah. survivors of crime. I'm glad you use the term survivors right. because that's what they are. We mm -hmm. are going to have the National Victims' Rights Week coming up in April. We have several scheduled events. One of the first in my county, a big event on that mm -hmm. Monday mm -hmm. uh, in, in April of that week. And, uh, and then uh, I'm going to get on an airplane and I've been invited to march to the Capitol and speak on behalf of Crime Victims United who mm -hmm. oversee the thousands of victims and families who have lost loved ones uh, across the state of California. And then we have our candlelight vigil back here mm -hmm. in our county, uh, both at the city of San Bernardino and then one in Rancho Cucamonga. But the key is we must never forget, especially the families that have lost loved ones to murder. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is their time to, of remembrance. And those folks are survivors. I mean, I can't imagine, thank God, mm -hmm. that I haven't lost anybody or a family member to a crime. And, and so this gives actually, us an opportunity. I, I, I had a cousin who was murdered. Yeah. And it is um, baffling, to mm -hmm. say the least. Right. Because it happens so very fast. Yeah. Oh. I mean, yeah. literally from one moment to the next. You're absolutely right. He went right. to work. He was gone with, upon entering his work and you don't even know what to do or say. Yeah, he left a three-year-old and a one-year-old. Well, let me tell you something. Mm -hmm. That's my argument about people. Why, why are we seeking death on these people? Mm -hmm. You know, victims didn't have an opportunity. Oh, can I right. have a few more days to say goodbye right. to my loved one? Mm -hmm. And these death penalty people, they're sitting there for years and years and years. Well, but could one argue that sitting there for years and years and years is much more punishing than being put to death? No. Why? Because they are getting they are getting treated better than a lot of people that are struggling in their lives. Like I said, three meals a day, color television, well, why correspondence. Do they get why know? do they get color television? You I mean, I'm, look, I, there's been a lot of talk about solitary confinement, sure. and I don't know that that's the answer. But the answer, and you're right, the answer is to get them out, get them working, like anybody else, like any other prisoner. Why do they have these rights? Make them be responsible for their conduct and their behavior and taking somebody, somebody's life. Mm -hmm. They should have to do what every other prisoner has to do. But let's, I wanna, if I may, just kind of delve deeper. Sure. I mean, there are many who believe that life in prison without parole is greater punishment than death. And I would argue against that. Because? because those that are serving life without, the, you know, life without right. parole, um, they get all the, the things that I'm talking what about. If they get to have back. conjugal visits right. with family. Right, well, what family. if we pull back on some of that? Um, I still think it comes down to this. Your belief is your life, your family's life, your children's life, is that somebody takes that life, should the person that takes that life, and, and, and this person may have murdered other people as right. well, should he be given the opportunity or she be given the opportunity right. to live the rest of their life with these comforts? I say no. I say there's something called punishment. Mm -hmm. And there's something called deterrence as well. And I think and you is combine those. I, is the death penalty a deterrent? I truly believe it is. In my experience as a trial lawyer before I was the elected DA, when you prosecute these cases, there are, there are these defendants and criminals that talked about, hey, I would have pulled the trigger, okay? Attempted murder. I would have shot this person, but I started thinking about it. It's called premeditation and deliberation. What that means is they're premeditating, I'm gonna kill somebody, and deliberation means they're weighing the consequences. That's what that whole concept is. And they actually do that, and believe me, they think about it. I, we know that from three, three strikers in the state of California. They think about that before they commit the third strike, before they commit the murder. Speaking of three strikes, uh, we know that we're through a process now called prison realignment, right. and three strikes at some level is under reform because it is. of realignment. It is. What's your sense of that, sir? Well, you know, I think in our county we're doing justice. Uh, we we have a, a process where one of my prosecutors, the public defender, and a judge, superior court judge, sits, and we review all of those that uh, qualify to be resentenced. Uh, and some of those uh, resentences, uh, I believe after the law was written is appropriate. Mm. Um, however, I truly believe that the worst of the worst three strikers will uh, continue to remain in prison and they, and they will okay. be. His name is Mike Ramos. He is the DA for San Bernardino County. When we come back, we'll speak with Paul Zellerbach. He's the Riverside County DA. I'm Brad Pomerantz. It's Charter California Edition. The California Victims Compensation Program receives how many applications per year? 
10,000, 25,000, 37,000, or 50,000. The California Victims Compensation Board receives over 50,000 applications a year. Welcome back to Charter California Edition. I'm Brad Pomerantz. Our guest, Paul Zellerbach, he is the DA for Riverside County running for re-election. That election will be held in June 2014. And sir, you have been speaking with me for quite some time about victims and victims' rights. Correct. Um, I had mentioned earlier to Mike Ramos, one of your counterparts, that my cousin was murdered. And this was many years ago, but it's a uh, stunning event and the survivors are left behind. Absolutely. And so talk to us about what you've been doing and will be doing to support victims and victims' rights. Well, I've been involved in the criminal justice system, as you know, Brad, for 36 years, both as a prosecutor and a superior right. court judge. Uh, yes, yes. And the law has changed dramatically recently with respect to affording victims constitutional rights. So we have the Marcy's Law and Megan's Law now that uh, afford victims certain constitutional rights. Well, let's be very specific because we may not realize the Constitution, as written, really focuses on the defendant. And we understand that because of, you know, oppressive regimes can take advantage of defendants. But here we are in a democracy. We're not in the business of taking advantage of defendants. Well, you don't want to take sides. Right. Um, and you want to level the playing field. And as you pointed out, for historically, defendants, right. criminal defendants, have had constitutional rights and protections, and that's appropriate. Right. But at the same time, we can't and never should forget the victims, and right. they have constitutional rights now as well, well. And what are they now? They have the right to address the court, primarily at sentencing. Wow. Um, and is this the, federal or state? This is state, state of Marcy? California. It's Marcy, right. yes. Uh, they have the right to uh, be heard and receive restitution or compensation right. for their loss, whether it be medical, financial, emotional, psychological. And that's the Crime Victims Compensation Board. Correct. Okay. Um, or if they, want to, if they need to receive counseling or therapy or their children. Um, need to receive counseling or therapy, uh, the defendant is responsible for paying that cost, mm -hmm. and appropriately so. And so in April, uh, we are, I don't want to say celebrating, but commemorating. And remembering. And remembering, well stated, crime victims throughout the nation. I know there is an event here in Riverside County, San Bernardino County is having events, I'm sure all over the state. They are. It's the 30th annual National Crime Victims Week in April. And actually what we do, because Riverside County is so large and so diverse, oh, of course. we hold three different events. Right. One in Southwest County, Temecula, one in uh, uh, Palm Desert in the Coachella Valley, and then of course here in Riverside. Why do you feel as if these events are important? You know, it's interesting, when you meet with the families and the hundreds of people that attend these events, they have bonded over the years. Um, it's kind of a cathartic experience for them. Um, and we reinforce the knowledge or the belief that we will never forget them or their families or their loved ones who've been killed or murdered. Mm -hmm. And uh, they... Um, it, it's interesting because when you think about crime victims, remembering victims, you could be the quote, victim yourself. Absolutely. As I have been mugged as an example. I don't, I mean, I'm fine, but you know, a crime victim or like, you know, a, a someone who survived as a result of the murder of someone. Well, or a family member or right. a close loved one or a friend. Right. Right. Um, absolutely. And yeah. so there, there could be different challenges, but it, it's nice to hear that there's a place for everyone to come and offer support and solace. Well, and we have candlelight vigils where we actually give candlelights to everyone. Um, you know, it's a flickering flame, but again, it, it will never blow out, and, and, and it, it's a remembrance of them. And then after the end, at the end of the Riverside uh, candlelight mm -hmm. vigil, we go over to our memorial wall in the mm -hmm. DA's office, where we have every homicide victim that's ever been killed in Riverside County. Oh, Their wow. name is up on do that you know wall. The, do you know the number? I don't know Hundreds, the numbers. Hundreds, thousands? Oh, Is it thousands? It's, um, we're, you know? over, we're in the thousands, you are. unfortunately. And it grows quite uh, proportionally every year. And this has been a year. tough year. We've lost a few officers as a result of the Christopher Dorner incident. Correct. Um, I, I'm thinking of other incidents recently in this area where it's been tough. It, it, it's Ryan, been, Bonham, uh, Ryan Bonham. Ryan Bonham, yeah, was the officer, officer from the police, Riverside right, Police Department. Unconnected to Christopher Dorner. Correct. And so it's been tough. And Michael... Crane, the officer right, exactly. who was involved in the Dorner right. situation who got killed in Riverside. Right. 
Okay, I want to shift gears, if I may, and speak with you about that ever-present topic, which is prison realignment. Yes. Um, I don't think we've spoken since the federal court actually has provided California an additional two years to decrease its prison population, to decrease, to contract the prison population. Correct. Sir, as a judge yourself, a former judge, I should say, were you surprised? I was shocked, given prior rulings when it sounded like they were going to throw Governor Brown in jail. Well, they, they had threatened to hold him in contempt. Exactly, which means you're going to jail. Exactly. <laughs> right, okay. Um, but at, at the same time, I felt everybody was posturing to, to make a statement. But I thought, bottom line was it was a public safety issue. Mm -hmm. And nobody, even the federal court, I don't think, wanted these dangerous felons released early. But what's interesting is Governor Brown said he would not do that. He said he was going to put them into alternate facilities, which would have been more expensive. Correct. Out-of-state facilities. And he had set aside tens of millions right. of dollars to fund that. So the court could have easily said, okay, do it. They could have. But I think also the court saw the governor making significant efforts and, and strides. But he had been doing that all, all along. I just, I'm trying to figure out why now. Why did they soften up now? Well, I, I think the governor also reached out to the prison law yes, reform that is group. True. That um, is true. It started having sessions and negotiations with them. Um, and they felt that the governor was listening, paying attention. And uh, in the next two years, hopefully we can all work it out. What does this do for counties? Does this help counties? I think it gives us a little relief, not much. Uh, again, I'm sponsoring a bill again in Sacramento. Yes, let's talk about this. Um, that limits the number of years that an inmate can serve in a county jail at three years. I want to be as specific as possible because people may not realize when you think about realignment, the goal of realignment was to decrease the prison population by having the three non-serve in county jails, non-serious, non-sexual, non-violent. Correct. By definition, you would think that means shorter sentences, under three years. Explain for our viewers why, in practice, that has not happened. Well, the problem is a lot of these non-violent, non-serious felons who are sentenced to local county jail have prison prior commitments or other types of enhancements, uh, such as a, a large amount of drugs or narcotics. That, that's the key. It's the enhancements that can cause the prison sentences to still be classified as the three nons, but send you way over the three years. Correct. In Riverside County, we have the longest sentence is about 14 years. Los Angeles County has an inmate that's serving a 42-year sentence in county jail. Yeah, I, I don't know how that's going to work. Let's face it. Prisons are built for uh, long-term visits. County jails are not. By no means. Right. And I, the governor's recognized that in his uh, budget proposal just a, a month or two ago. He uh, provided that anyone who had the 10-year or longer sentence should go to prison. Oh, really? So it's a step in the right direction. So, was that passed yet, or that's a no, proposal? It, it's, it's a proposal. But that's still, 10 years is a long time it, in a facility that's meant for three years. It's too long. It's a step in the right direction, but not enough. It's got to be three or more. I remember last year we talked about a proposal whereby there would be a swap. So you, the county would take someone who's finishing his long-term sentence. Correct. They're and, their, their last year. Right. And you would send these long-termers that were considered three nons to the state. And that failed. Well, it failed, but uh, that's why I spent two days up in Sacramento right. earlier this week right. meeting with uh, people from the California Department of Corrections, meeting with the state finance people, meeting with the governor's office to see if we can work out some sort of exchange program. I would think that with the pressure off, as a result of the federal court giving two more years, it, now's the time. I mean, am I wrong? Well, um, I think right. now is the time. Uh, there are those people that still believe that financially uh, we can't do it. Um, but again, I, I think it's a win-win situation. If you ask the inmates themselves, right. they'll say, send me to state prison rather than keep me in my county jail cell. So is the current bill creating a swap situation or is it simply three years or more, you're off to in its, in its current form, it's three years or more you're off to prison, but we've made it clear uh, to people that, uh, that the swap situation can be included or amended into the bill. Could it be that what needs to change is not so much the, the artificial number of three years, but the types of crimes that are defined as the triple nons? I, I still don't think that will solve the problem because even though you define the crime, we still have the issue, as you pointed out, Brad, of enhancements. So should enhance, uh, yeah, I mean, I guess that's when you get into the, the year amount. Correct. That's what exponentially raises the commitment. So are you feeling like this is the year? Does it pass this year? Uh, you know, I'm always hopeful. <laughs> I'm always hopeful. <laughs> His name is Paul Zellerbach. He is the DA for Riverside County running for re-election, which will be held in June 2014. I'm Brad Pomerantz. Thanks for watching Charter California Edition.